Hi there, uh, my name is Mark. I'm part of the preaching team here at um, Together Church Tor Bay, and welcome to this week's midweek encouragement video. We're going to be following up on um, Sunday's sermon on Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through to the end of the chapter. Now, what we find in this um, passage of scripture, really excitingly, are two big ticket miracles. I'm a simple kind of chap, and every time I come across an account of the miraculous in scripture, um, what I need to take away from it, and what I need to remind myself, and I suggest that perhaps something you need to be reminded of as well today, is that we have a God who can do the impossible. Um, even in the last month, I've seen God do the impossible in the life of two of my friends, um, which is just so encouraging. And I want to encourage you, lift your eyes to the one who can do the impossible. Lift your eyes to Jesus. Seek him for whatever breakthrough it is that you need in your life. We have a God who does the impossible. What I like as well about this um, chapter, well, this passage in Acts, and in fact, it's true of, of all of Luke's gospel and, and Acts, um, is that Luke, the author, is very much deliberately writing history. He's looking at evidence. He's done his research. He's talked to people. And, and it really lays that out for us um, at the beginning of Acts and also at the beginning of the Gospel. Um, but as well, what we see in this particular passage is Luke was a doctor. He was a man of science. And he's got some very specific notes in his case book about these miracles, about these healings. Um, if we look at the first one, the, the rising up of Aeneas, here is a guy, Luke tells us, who was a cripple for eight years. Now, what Luke's showing us is that this isn't some kind of psychosomatic thing where, you know, Aeneas was perhaps a little bit depressed and, you know, feeling a bit ropey. And then Peter prayed for him and that was encouraging. And, you know, consequently, he felt a bit better. No, here is a guy who literally cannot move for eight years. And his life is totally transformed. His dignity is restored. Jesus Christ heals you, Peter said to him. And he was a different man. What I love about the account of Peter is that actually it's not about him. You know, there's no kind of, hi, I'm Peter, I'm the wonderful apostle. You know, I do you know what? I hung out with Jesus for three years. Um, you, you can get my autograph. I'll sell you some books. Um, you know, please follow me on YouTube. There's none of that. Peter puts the focus on Jesus. And Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And when Jesus turns up, significant change happens. And I'd like to encourage you. Pray for situations that need significant change. Pray for folk you know who need Jesus to turn up. And what Peter said to Ananias, as well as Jesus Christ heals you, is rise up. And I just wonder whether there's one or two of you where actually that's what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. Rise up. Rise up. When we look at the account of um, Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, again, Luke puts in very specific detail. The body has been washed. It's been moved to an upstairs room. And what we find is that there's no real risk of misdiagnosis here. Breath has ceased. There is no heart activity. This lady is dead. But Jesus brings her physically from death to life. And spiritually, when someone becomes a Christian, that is what happens. They go from death to life. From darkness to light. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians that you were dead in your sins. You were dead in your transgressions. But God, who is rich in mercy, has made you alive in Christ. And I wonder, 
Is that your experience? Can you say of yourself, I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. And, and if you can't say that, that can be your experience. Right now, stop the video and talk to God about it. And it might be, for, for those of us who, who do know Jesus, that actually God's just putting somebody on your heart, somebody on your mind to pray for, that they might be experiencing this miracle of new life themselves. One thing that we'll notice as well in our passage is there are lots of echoes of Jesus. Pete touched a little bit on this when he was talking about the healings. And I've got a slightly peculiar one for you. Now, I love the story of Dorcas. Um, the whole thing of the all the different tunics that she'd made. It reminds me of my grandma. My grandma um, lived in um, Norfolk. And um, when I'd go and visit her, quite often I'd get sent off to the garage. Um, so she had a garage attached to the, to the bungalow she lived in. And there was a, a chest freezer in there. And that's where the ice cream was. So, you know, I was, I was very happy to go and get an ice cream, um, you know, as a as a young lad but very often in that garage there'd be boxes and boxes of and bags of clothes that her and her friends had made to send to the poor in all parts of the world um she was one of those people who would just organize people um so i remember when she moved into a residential home it was like right we'll have the prayer group here we're going to have the Bible study here. And she'd organise these ladies to, to make clothes for people who needed them all over the world. And they'd be, be sent out from this unassuming garage in, in Norfolk. So Dorcas um, and you know, the tunics that she made very much remind me of my grandma. And ice cream, weirdly enough. In um, this passage, Dorcas is described as being someone who was always doing good and helping the poor. Now, interestingly, in the next chapter of Acts, when Peter is preaching to Cornelius, um, so spoiler alert, he describes Jesus, so this is Acts 10, verse 38, in these terms, he says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good. Jesus went around doing good. Dorcas was full of good deeds. She was always doing good and helping the poor. She loved Jesus. And she became like Jesus because the Holy Spirit was at work in her and she was always doing good. If Jesus was always doing good, then if you're one of his people, then that must be true of you. And can I encourage you to be deliberate about that, to be intentional, to commit many deliberate acts of mercy. I love the story of William Wilberforce and his mates. They were known as the Clapham sect because they lived in Clapham. And... They were instrumental in the abolition of the slave trade. And when finally, after many, many years of hard work and prayer and toil, really, um, the slave trade was abolished, they looked around at one another and said, what should we abolish next? Now, not that they were a bunch of miseries and wanted to abolish things, but actually they saw evil as an affront to God. They saw injustice as something, well, we need to put it right with God's people. Jesus went around doing good. We're going to go around doing good. Right, what can we do next? And I encourage you to pray, to plan, and to conspire with other people to commit as many deliberate acts of mercy and kindness and goodness as you can. Where you see injustice, in the name of Jesus, rise up and squash it down. Now, both healings um, really echo how, how Jesus went about healing. And you can see that in um, this account of Tabitha Dorcas really closely parallels Jesus's healing of, well, in fact, raising up of Jairus' Jairus's daughter from the dead in Luke chapter 8. What has happened is that Peter has learned from Jesus. A disciple follows his master. What have you learned from Jesus? What Jesus stuff is coming out in your life. So I encourage you, pray lots. Pray for people to know new life. Pray for people to get healed. Pray for breakthroughs. And pray that the Jesus stuff will come out of you. Thanks so much. You take care.